All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. So uh, we've been in the course for about six weeks, and most of that six weeks we've, you know, whether we made a big deal of it or not, been talking about equilibria. So the whole time we were discussing mechanisms, we were discussing what are called dominant strategy equilibria. Last week when we were talking about routing games, you know, we talked about equilibrium flows, both in non-atomic and atomic models. But uh, I don't think I've even really writ uh, ever written the definition of an equilibrium on the board. I haven't been treating them as first order objects. And today we're going to change that. So today we're really going to talk about equilibria, um, a bunch of different flavors of them, when they exist, uh, and so on. So to begin, let me just remind you where we left off at the end of Wednesday. So last week we talked about the price of anarchy and routing games. And the last result that we gave is we looked at atomic selfish routing. So remember, atomic is where you have a finite number of players, each of non-negligible size. And we proved that when you have affine cost functions of the form AX plus B, the worst case price of anarchy in those networks is exactly 2.5. So I showed you a lower bound. That was a bi-directed triangle with four players, where there was indeed an equilibrium that was 2.5 off from optimal. And we proved an upper bound that held in general networks. So there can be multiple equilibria, but every Nash equilibrium of every atomic selfish routing game with affine cost functions is no worse than 2.5 times the cost of optimum. OK, but uh, if we sort of really scrutinize what we proved, every single equilibrium, and there may be many, is within a small constant factor of optimum, there's still something we should be worried about, which is how do we know that in every instance, there's at least one equilibrium. We know there can be more than one, but how can we be sure that sometimes there isn't zero? And if there's no equilibria, then these price of anarchy bounds would be vacuous. And on Wednesday, I was focusing on what are called pure or deterministic Nash equilibria. That is, when we talked about what a player was allowed to do, it had to pick a single path to route one unit of traffic. And we looked for a collection of paths so that nobody could deviate and strictly decrease their cost. So that's, a, that's an equilibrium with no randomization. And we know there are games where there are none of these pure Nash equilibria. Does anyone remember one? Like maybe from lecture one? Good. Rock, paper, scissors is a very simple game where there's no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. You have to randomize to be at an equilibrium. Right? If you always play scissors, then the other player will always play rock and so on. So atomic selfish routing games are a remarkable class of games in that the existence of these pure equilibria is guaranteed. Okay? So that's not obvious. It's not hard to prove, but it's not obvious. And that's the next result I want to discuss, Rosenthal's theorem. So this is an old result, 40 years ago. So in every atomic selfish routing network, and not just with affine cost functions, with any functions you want, has at least one equilibrium. And we already know there can be more than one. Okay? Yep? Um, yeah, they're pretty. Di they're different in the sense that in routing games, if more people pick your strategies, it's always bad for you. Whereas in rock paper scissors, there isn't that. There isn't that property, so you don't have the same kind of monotonicity. So, I mean, in some sense, just by virtue of Rosenthal's theorem, we now know that that can't be true. But but more directly, there's sort of a um, a consistency in people's preferences in routing games, which is what gives rise to this result. Correct. So the plan for the proof uh, is I'm going to show that every selfish routing network is what's called the potential game. 
And potential games always have Shure Nash equilibrium. And at a high level, uh, what you do in a potential game is you show, you basically anthropomorphize all of these players, and you show that they can be, they act as if they are trying to collectively optimize a single function, which we call the potential function. And then what we'll see is that at the global optimum of this potential function that people are inadvertently trying to optimize, that has to be a Nash equilibrium. So there aren't a lot of techniques for proving that games are guaranteed to have pure equilibria, in part because many games do not have pure equilibria. And this is probably the most useful one. Okay, so there's very few tools for proving existence of pure equilibria, and this is the number one that you should know. So let me show you what the potential function is. So the, the potential function assigns a real number to every possible flow. Okay, and a flow is just a choice of a path by each of the k players in the selfish routing network. And the potential function is the following. It looks quite similar to the edge-based expression we had for the total travel time, but it's a little different. But we again sum over the edges. And on a given edge, recall f sub e is the notation for the number of players that choose a path that includes the edge e. So we're going to sum from i equals 1 to the number of players using that edge of the cost function of that edge evaluated at i. So this is a little weird, so let me show you a picture. So on an edge where f sub e was 3, where three players are using it, this sum, you just evaluate the cost function at the, at the values 1, 2, and 3. And you would just add up the area under the corresponding rectangles. Okay? So on a given edge with three players, that's what you'd get for this sum. Now, just to help you relate to this, let's compare and contrast it to that edge-based expression we had for the total travel time. So one way to count up the cost of a flow is you sum over the edges, and then on an edge you look at the number of players using that edge, f sub e, times the common cost they all incur, c sub e times f sub e. So instead of this sum, which has f sub e sum ends, right, so if there's five players here, we're adding up five things, it would be five times just the cost when all five players are there. So put differently, for the total travel cost function, for the total travel time, rather than this blue staircase, we would be paying attention to its bounding box, okay? To its pink bounding box. So this is what we were concerned with on Wednesday. We wanted to minimize this. The potential function is a bit different. It's the staircase instead, okay? Now, I haven't told you why you, why you should care about this definition. And here's the surprising property. So give us a the surprising property of the potential function. There's a sense in which this potential function simultaneously tracks the costs of all of the players. So if a player I deviates. Say it was using path P, PI, in the original flow F, and suppose it deviates to a different SITI path, let's say P hat I, and let's call the new flow F hat. So F hat is just the old flow F, but with I reassigned.
the claim is if we look at this deviation by player i, the change in the potential function, so the difference between phi of f hat, the new flow, and phi of f, the old hat, sorry, the old flow, is exactly the change in cost that I itself incurs in these two flows. Okay? So that's the claim. Okay, so the claim is this should hold no matter where you start from, no matter what f is, no matter which player i you're allowing to deviate, and no matter which path p hat i they're, uh, being de they're deviating to. So in this sense, this single function phi, which notice is defined independently of any player i, it's just a single global function, it's simultaneously tracking uh, the sort of you know, possible changes in cost faced by all of the players. Okay, so that's the key claim. So let me prove the claim for you, and then I'll explain why the claim implies Rosenthal's theorem. Okay? So proof of claim. So once you've actually guessed, once you know you've pulled this potential function phi, as you know, the rabbit out of the hat, it's easy to verify this property. So what is the left-hand side? Well, phi is defined as this sum over edges. For any edge which is in neither its old path pi nor its new path p hat i, of course, it doesn't change. This part doesn't change. For any edge which is in both the old path and the new path, it doesn't change. For any edge which is in the new path and not in the old path, so an edge which player i newly uses, we're going to pick up an extra term in this sum and. Okay, so if there used to be five players using it, and now player i is the sixth player, once it switches to it, we pick up a sixth sum and, which is c sub e evaluated at six. Okay. Similarly, for any edge that player i is abandoning, then we shed the final sum and. So if it used to be one of five players, this is going to shed the fifth sum and c e of five. So in other words, the change in the potential function value, you just look at all the edges that are in its new path and not its old path, and you pick up a CE of FE plus 1. The plus 1 is because I is now, remember, this counts how many players were using it F. This is because I is a new player using it. You look at all the edges that it's abandoning, it used to use and now it doesn't, and you shed the final sum and CE of F sub E. Okay, so that's expanding the left-hand side. And now if you think about it, this is actually exactly the right-hand side here too. Okay? From player I's perspective, how does its cost change when it switches paths? Well, edges in neither path don't matter. Edges in both paths, it pays the same before and after. Any edge which it uses now and it didn't used to, it has to pay its cost. Okay, and again, if there used to be five players, it's the sixth player, and it pays like the other five players, the cost when there's six players on the edge. And anything it abandons, it used to pay CE of F sub B, and now it's not in its path, so it doesn't. Okay? So this sum is just the right-hand side. All right? So that's the proof of the key claim, that... From any flow, for any deviator i and any deviation p hat i, the change in the potential function is exactly the same number as the change in cost that this player i incurs if it switches to the path p hat i. So let me explain why the key claim implies the theorem. So now, what the key claim is saying is that these players, 
little, little beknownst to them, are in effect uh, trying to minimize this global function phi. Okay? So let's consider the outcome, which actually has the absolute smallest phi value. Right. So there's only a finite number of possible outcomes in this game. One of them has a smaller phi value than any other. Call it f. Since this has the smallest phi value of them all, there is, of course, no deviation by a player that leads you to an outcome with smaller phi. There isn't such an outcome. Well, by the key claim, the change in your cost when you deviate is exactly the change in the potential. So if every deviation can only make the potential go up, then every deviation can only make the cost of the deviator go up. That is exactly the definition of a Nash equilibrium. Okay. So why is there a Nash equilibrium? It's because there first of all, there exists a potential function. That's the really non-trivial part. There exists a potential function. You can look at the global minimizer of the potential function, and that has to be an equilibrium. Okay, so one exists. All right, so at least there are some classes of games, in particular the ones we were obsessed with last week, where pure equilibria are guaranteed. Rock, paper, scissors, no. Routing games, yes. Right. Questions? Exactly. Yep, finite number of players. Each has a finite number of the paths in this finite network it could try. So one of them has at least as small a fee value as anything else. All right. So I gave you this argument just for atomic selfish routing games, but it's actually a, a flexible argument. So let me just pause and mention some notable extensions which relates to either things we've talked about before or things we'll talk about in the future. So whenever we've talked about routing games, we've made the sort of natural assumption that cost functions only go up. So the more, the more traffic there is on an edge, the higher the cost is for everybody. This proof actually doesn't need that hypothesis, if you look at this proof. Okay, the cost functions can be literally anything. Doesn't matter, okay? So proof still works. If the CEs are not non-decreasing, we'll make use of this fact next week when we talk about a model called network cost-sharing games. The second thing to notice is, I mean, this whole theorem and its argument has nothing to do about networks per se. Okay, so these strategies P sub I, if they were just sort of arbitrary subsets from some ground set, rather than paths in the network, it wouldn't matter. The exact same proof would work. Right? We never referenced the fact that there was network structure. So in this sort of more abstract setting, these are called congestion games. And that's a word you see a lot in this, uh, this part of the woods. So it wasn't important that E represented the edges of a network, and it wasn't important that the PIs, that the strategies, <coughs> were uh, paths in a network. And third and finally, I want to make a couple remarks about the non-atomic model that we discussed last week on Monday in the first part of Wednesday. So remember, in the non-atomic model, that's where we had Pigou's example embraces paradox. That's where we had negligible sized players like cars in the highway and we looked at fractional flows. 
And back then I asked you to take it on faith that equilibria exist and are unique. I'm not going to give you formal proofs. You can find formal proofs in the AGT book. But I'll give you sort of the moral reason why both of those two facts are true. And basically it's because of a potential function like this. There's a question. Yes. The answer is yes. Okay. So that's, uh, and we'll actually discuss that explicitly in about two weeks. Yep, but you're absolutely right. So the comment was, it seems like potential functions should have implications not just ex for existence, but also for dynamics. And indeed they do. Okay, and we'll talk about dynamics at some length a little later in the course. Question? Uh, that I, that's not the case. So it is important that the cost functions are anonymous. Yeah. So the, the model where cost functions depend on the players is an interesting model, but some of the properties break down. Okay? Yeah. Including, including this one. All right, so for non-atomic selfish routing, you use basically the exact same potential function. Uh, it doesn't quite type check at the moment because this is for a finite number of players. So for an infinite number of players that are small, you should just replace the sum by an integral. Okay? So you just consider the potential function where you sum over the edges, and instead of counting up 1, 2, 3, all the way up to f sub e, you just integrate from 0 to f sub e of the cost function. Okay, so that's the relevant potential function. Now, when I introduced non-atomic selfish routing, we assumed that the cost functions were continuous. I didn't really ever tell you why that was important, and there was even a question about that, but now we see why it's important. Um, so phi is continuous. Um, anyways, so phi is a continuous function, and for that reason, it has some global minimizer. Okay, there is some, it's not, it's no longer true that there's a finite number of outcomes, but because phi is a continuous function and the space of all flows is a compact set, phi does achieve a global minimum on it. And just like the global minimizer of the discrete potential function was a Nash equilibrium, so too here is the global minimizer of this potential function an equilibrium flow in the non-atomic sense. Okay? That requires proof, but it, it is true. Okay. So that covers the existence in the non-atomic model. So what about uniqueness? Well, we also were assuming that the cost functions were non-decreasing. So if you integrate a non-decreasing function, you get a convex function. Okay? So this potential function phi is convex. So what that means is that phi, this potential function, has no local minima that are not also global minima. Okay, that's a standard property of convex functions. You know, think about like a parabola uh, defined on convex sets. Okay? And since the equilibrium flows turn out to correspond to local, local minima, and the only local minima are global minima, and global minima are essentially unique, so too are equilibrium flows essentially unique in this non-atomic model. Okay? So again, the basic reason for uniqueness is convexity of the potential function, which just comes from the form of the uh, potential function and the non-decreasing cost functions. Okay, so that's morally why you have uniqueness here. Okay, so the global minimizer is the only equilibrium flow. Okay. Uh huh? Couldn't you have a function that like goes flat and then curves up and then over and goes flat again and over and 
No, it wouldn't be convex. Well, all right, but it's on the So the key point is that the potential function is convex. Okay, so this was all very good news. Okay, this was all saying that the games that we were obsessed with last week have even more nice properties than we thought. Equilibria are guaranteed to exist, so all of our nice price of anarchy bounds are non-vacuous. Really, they're talking about objects which are there. So that's good. But as we know, not all games are so nice. So there's still the question looking ahead as we want to reason about other application domains. So what about games with no equilibrium? Okay, no pure equilibrium. All right. So as we said, rock, paper, scissors is one example. But there's actually games very closely related to the games we've already been analyzing where you also lose the existence of pure equilibrium. So for example, one minor tweak I can make to the atomic selfish routing model is to allow players to have different, to control different amounts of flow. On Wednesday, every player controlled a single unit of flow. What if there's like two players, one of them has one unit of flow and the other has two units of flow? Okay. Turns out you already lose the guaranteed existence of pure equilibrium, okay. even then. So it's not hard um, to come up with an example, but I'm not going to spend class time on it. I'll just uh, refer you to the AGT book. It's example 18.4. And it's an example that just has two players. One has one weight, unit weight. The other has weight two, and the cost functions are quadratic. Okay? And there's no pure equilibrium in a very small selfish routing network example. So Rosenstahl's theorem, you know, it's great when it holds, but the question remains, what do you do when it doesn't hold? Okay. So the fact that there's no pure equilibrium in a model like this, that doesn't change the fact that we want to reason about it. We want to understand the usual questions. When is the price of anarchy small? When is the behavior by strategic players likely to lead to an outcome which is not too far to optimal? Okay. But because there's no pure equilibrium, we have to take a somewhat different attack. Okay. For have a meaningful price of anarchy bound in a model like these, we have to enlarge the set of equilibria to recover guaranteed existence so that we can have meaningful price of anarchy analyses. Okay, and so that's the plan from here on. Question? Is not what? Um, I see what you're saying. I don't think it's equivalent. I mean, they're not, they're not unrelated, but I don't see an equivalence in either direction. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand your question. Um, and yeah, I mean, they're not unrelated, but I don't see a specific technical connection. It's a question, yeah. Because in Rosenthal's uh, proof, all the players have the same weight. Right, so when a player moved to an edge, we knew it was plus one. It was never plus two. Yeah. So there's really kind of a phase transition between whether all players have exactly the same weight or not. At least there's a phase transition with respect to the existence of pure equilibria. What we don't know at the moment is whether there's some phase transition in terms of the price of anarchy. And in fact, once we develop richer equilibrium concepts, we'll see that there isn't. We'll see that exactly the same theory applies to both the unweighted and the weighted case. But to do that, we really need to talk about more general equilibrium concepts, and that's the subject for the rest of this lecture. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me? That implied it was a Nash equilibrium. Okay. Yeah. I mean, not 
I mean, in a convex function, if it's strictly convex, the answer is just no. And if it's weakly convex, you have this flat bit at the bottom, which are all optima, and all of those will be equilibria, and they'll be essentially the same equilibrium. Yeah, so that was for the non-atomic model, where we were talking uniqueness. So as we know, we do not have uniqueness in the atomic model. So it's an interesting extra feature of the non-atomic model that you have uniqueness. And the reason you have it is because of convexity of the potential function. Oh, okay. So I hope the motivation of where we are right now is clear. Pure equilibria have gotten us you know, as, as far as they, as they have. We began with a model, non-atomic selfish routing, which was special in that we had both existence of equilibria and uniqueness. So it was very clear what the price of anarchy should be. Then we graduated to atomic selfish routing, where we still had existence of pure equilibria, but we had multiple equilibria. So we had to redefine the price of anarchy in terms of the worst pure equilibrium. So now that we're pushing it even further, we lose existence of pure equilibria, and we need to move on to more permissive equilibrium concepts. I'm going to show you three in the rest of this lecture. One, you already know, mixed strategy and Nash equilibria, but I'm still going to talk a little bit about it. Two are probably new to most of you, correlated equilibria and coarse correlated equilibria. Okay, and the focus will be on so each of these will be, in some sense, a strict superset of the previous one, will be more general, more permissive. And the focus is going to be on when do we have guaranteed existence, and a subtext will be when do we have computational tractability of these equilibrium concepts. All right, so to discuss these equilibrium concepts simply, let me just kind of formalize the games we've been talking about uh, in the last week. So a cost minimization game, and just go ahead and think about, you know, selfish routing as a canonical example, that's fine. So the ingredients are, you have players, finite set, K players. Each player has its options, so a strategy set. These are also going to be finite, A1 through AK. So in a routing example, these would correspond to SITI pairs. These would just be SITI paths in some network. And then for every player, I have to tell you what is the cost it incurs in a given outcome. And again, an outcome is just a choice of a strategy by each of the players. Okay? So for all I, I tell you a cost function, CI, where here S, the vector S, is called either a strategy profile or an outcome. Okay? So this is just like a traffic pattern. Okay? And this would be the cost that I incur when it picks a given path in a given traffic pattern. Okay? So we already, um, just for the record, You already know what a pure Nash equilibrium is, but just to compare it to the other three concepts I'm going to tell you about. How would we write it in this notation? Well, so no player can be better off by unilateral deviation. Okay, so S is a pure Nash equilibrium. If for every potential deviator, every potential deviation I look at its cost after deviating. So I hope you remember this notation from mechanism design. This is just holding the other player's strategies fixed. Player I deviates to something else S prime I, and it can only be worse off by deviating. That is, the cost should only be higher than in the equilibrium. Okay, and this is true simultaneously for all I. And these are great when you got them. but it need not exist. So to track the progress in this lecture, let's use a sort of running diagram to keep track of our four equilibrium concepts, each one more permissive than the previous. So the smallest set is going to be the pure strategy Nash equilibria. And the first big issue with um, is that need, need not exist. Okay. So, let's move on to mixed strategy Nash equilibria. 
We talked about these in rock, paper, scissors in lecture one, how the only way to have a sensible pair of equilibrium strategies in rock, paper, scissors is to allow both of the players to randomize uniformly over the three available strategies. So in general, the candidates for mixed strategy Nash equilibria are each player, rather than picking a single action deterministically, it picks a distribution over its actions. The assumption is that then players pick at random a strategy independently, each from the distribution that they've chosen. And then it should be at an equilibrium in the sense that this exact same inequality should hold, but now an expectation, where expectation is over the random choices made by all of the players. Okay? So a mixed equilibrium. So now, instead of a vector of strategies, we look at a vector of distributions over strategies. And these form a mixed Nash equilibrium if, again, for all potential deviators, for all potential deviations, S prime i, the deviation only increases your expected cost. Okay? So at equilibrium, again, how do we evaluate your cost? All players pick a strategy at random, independently. So I'm going to write sigma for the product distribution. And then over here, I look at your expected cost if you deviate, that's an S prime. Okay. So on the left-hand side, in general, all K components of this are random, right? Because each player is choosing SI at random from sigma I. In the right-hand side, these k minus 1 components are again random. They're chosen just as before from those players' mixed distributions. This is deterministic. This is a fixed pure strategy S prime i that we're considering as a deviation. Now, perhaps you'd think about an alternative definition. Well, if players are allowed to mix, why not allow them to mix when they deviate? Okay? Here I forced them to deviate to a pure strategy. So you could, you could write down the definition where you could actually deviate to a sigma prime i you get exactly the same definition. Okay, so I'll ask you to work that out in the exercise set. So it doesn't matter whether you check just the pure deviations or the mixed ones. Either way, that's the mixed Nash equilibrium. Okay? All right. So what I hope is obvious is that the pure Nash equilibria are exactly the mixed Nash equilibria when each sigma i is a point mass, plays a single strategy with 100% probability. Okay, so I hope it's obvious pure Nash equilibria are a subset of the mixed Nash equilibria. Rock, paper, scissors shows us it can be a strict subset as well. Okay? So the mixed Nash equilibria contain the pure Nash equilibria and possibly more. Now, by virtue of being a bigger set, it's conceivable that we've recovered existence. Okay? We know this might be empty, might be non-empty. This can only be bigger. So a highly non-obvious question is whether that set is always non-empty, whether a mixed equilibrium is guaranteed to exist. So we're not going to talk about the proof now. We'll talk about the proof in a few weeks. But indeed, Nash's theorem from 1950 says that in... Uh, every finite game, there is indeed at least one mixed Nash equilibrium. Okay? So while the innermost set need not exist, this set is guaranteed to exist. So that's the good news. The 
bad news is a much more recent development, really a 21st century development, which is that despite its universal existence, it can be as hard as finding a needle in a haystack. Okay? So it can be computationally intractable. We'll discuss at some length, probably in the last week of the course, the sense in which computing a Nash equilibrium is computationally intractable. It's okay if for now you think of it as something like NP hardness, but you should know that the truth is rather more complicated. And again, I'll explain, uh, explain what I mean by that at the end of the course. All right? So that's the bad news. We know a Nash equilibrium is out there, but in a precise sense, in general, it's hard to compute. So don't forget our mission when we started on this strategy of cataloging equilibrium concepts. We were bummed that our pri we, you know, we were concerned about price of anarchy analyses that were vacuous. Okay? So when we move to mixed Nash equilibria, what's happened? Well, because we've recovered guaranteed existence, at least the price of anarchy is well defined for the mixed Nash equilibria of a game. There's at least one, you can just take the worst case over however many there are. Okay? So it makes sense to define the price of anarchy. Given that it's hard to compute one of these equilibria, though, in general, it's not clear that that bound is meaningful. If you prove that every mixed Nash equilibrium is within a factor two of an optimal solution, but it's hard to even find one of those equilibria, maybe I don't care that much about the bound. Right? If there's no reason to expect players to have found one of these equilibria solving this intractable problem, maybe it's not so interesting to have a bound on their quality. Okay? So that motivates going even beyond the you know, very well-known mixed Nash equilibrium concept and looking at still more general equilibrium concepts to recover, we're gonna have existence from here on out, but now we wanna recover computational tractability and the flip side of that coin is sort of behavioral plausibility. Okay. All right. So here's the third equilibrium concept. This one is the most subtle of the four. Okay, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll allow some time for it. It's called a correlated equilibrium. I'm just curious, who's heard of a correlated equilibrium before? A few of you, okay. So I'll give you the definition. Then I'll give you some proposed semantics for the definition, which are also kind of the original semantics proposed by Alman, proposed it back in 74, around the same time as Rosenthal's theorem, as it turns out. And then we'll look at a very simple example, and usually it's the simple example at which point people really kind of get the concept. Okay? So for pure Nash equilibria, we were talking about a vector of fixed strategies. For mixed Nash equilibria, we talked about a vector of distributions over strategies. And then we discussed the product distribution that induced over all of the outcomes. In a correlated equilibrium, we work directly with a distribution, not necessarily product distribution, a distribution over all of the outcomes of the game, all of the strategy profiles. So distribution sigma on the space of all outcomes. Okay, so like in rock, paper, scissors, where you have a two by three by three matrix, this would be a distribution over nine things, the nine possible outcomes of rock, paper, scissors. Okay. So distribution sigma on the outcomes. is a correlated equilibrium. If, again, for all players I, but now differently for all pairs of strategies, SI and SI prime. So let me just write the definition and then we'll talk about the semantics. If the expected cost of a player 
under the distribution sigma. So, so far it looks familiar. But here's what's different. Conditioned on SI. Okay. So sigma is a distribution of all the outcomes of the game, like the nine outcomes in rock, paper, scissors. SI is some particular strategy, like maybe rock. Okay. So if you're the row player, in three of the outcomes, you're playing rock. In six of the outcomes, you're not. So this is saying, look at your conditional cost in the subset of outcomes in which you're playing the strategy SI, where SI is fixed. And this cost should be no more than the analogous conditional expected cost if you deviate to SI prime. So let me tell you one way you can think about this. No. Yeah, conditioned on SI. That's why I'm about to tell you, as, it, as I said. So why, under what situation might a player I actually be reasoning about these two quantities? Okay. There's a couple answers, but here's the original answer. And again, I'll give you the semantics, and then I think it'll really hit home once I give you a simple example. Okay, but let me just go through the semantics for now. So imagine, if you will, that this distribution sigma is publicly known. Okay? All players know what it is. Imagine there's some trusted third party, okay? trusted by all the players. And the, the, the trusted third party has two responsibilities. The first responsibility is to draw a sample from sigma privately. Okay? Does it like this. Picks a sample from sigma. Okay? For starters, it doesn't tell anybody. Now, this trusted third party is going to have a private conversation, or actually monologue, with each of the K players separately. Okay? In its monologue with player I, it's going to tell player I, I think you should pay, play the strategy S sub I. Okay? Gives player I some friendly advice. The other K minus one players do not hear this. Okay? As a player I, you hear only the recommendation by the trusted third party to yourself, not to any of the K minus one players. Furthermore, you're given this advice, but you're actually free to choose whatever strategy you want. Okay? You can either follow the, the, the trusted third party's advice and play SI, or you can play some other strategy, S prime I, if you prefer. Trusted third party now goes away, disappears. Okay? And as a player, so what this is encoding is for player eyes, it's saying, given the information, all of the information that I has available to it at the time that it has to pick a strategy, it should be in I's best interest to follow the recommendation of the trusted third party. Okay, it can do whatever it wants, but given what it knows, and let's review what it knows, it knows the distribution sigma from which this outcome, S, was drawn. And it knows the ith component of the sample. Okay? We have a distribution. We have a realization. If you're player I, you know the distribution. You don't know the realization. But then you learn the ith component of the realization. And now, of course, you have a posterior distribution on S minus I. You don't know the rest of the realization, but you can do a Bayes update. Okay, you know, conditionally on being told that the ith component is SI, you know some conditional distribution on S minus I. That's the information at your disposal at the time you make a decision. And this is just saying it's in your best interest to actually play SI, not something else. Okay. So 
again, the two assumptions we're making. So any rational player should condition on S sub i. That's part of the information it's got. So when you do this uh, computation of expected cost, you condition on knowing the i-th component of the realization. And then also, you know, because your cost depends on the action taken by the other k minus 1 players, you have to make some assumption about what the other k minus 1 players do. And the sensible assumption in a correlated equilibrium is you assume the other k minus 1 players indeed follow their recommendations. Okay? So you assume they're actually going to play s minus i. Not just be recommended s minus i, but take the recommendations and play s minus i. Okay, so let's proceed to the simple example, which will hopefully make all of this clear. So believe it or not, an everyday example of a correlated equilibrium is a stoplight, traffic light. And this is true in surprisingly literal terms. Okay, so what's the game I'm talking about? Well, you're going east-west, someone else is going north-south. Okay, there's an intersection. And your two strategies are to stop or to go. Okay. Let's normalize it so that if you stop, your payoff is zero. Obviously, it's better if you get to go, given that the other person stopped. So, let's say that. And obviously, it's pretty bad for both players if you both. <laughs> so let's say minus 5, minus 5. Okay. Let's say it's low speed accident. All right. Um, good. So what are the, uh, okay, so let's think about this game for a second. Let's start simple. Uh, how about pure Nash equilibria? Does the game have any pure Nash equilibria? What will be a pure Nash equilibrium? Well, we know it has a mixed Nash equilibrium because it's a game. But does it, does it in fact have pure equilibrium? That's right. So if one player goes and the other stops, you know, what are you going to do? The player who goes is happy. The player who stops, you know, would rather go, but given the other person's going, you're stuck. Okay. And then, of course, there's a symmetric, so there's two symmetric pure Nash equilibria. There's actually a somewhat bizarre third mixed Nash equilibrium, too. But uh, we won't really need to talk about it. Okay. So the pure Nash equilibria. are go, stop, and stop, go. Okay? Now one issue with games that have multiple equilibria is the players kind of have to figure out, they have to coordinate on which one to be in. Okay? And that can be hard. Right? And you see this in real life, situations where there's multiple equilibria and there's friction because different players are sort of angling for different ones of those equilibria. So you can think about a traffic light as a coordination device, which basically tells the players which of these two equilibria they should be in. So in more detail, so consider the distribution over outcomes. Okay, so this is a distribution with four entries, because there's four outcomes of the game. And uh, let's say it, uh, it just randomizes 50-50 between the two pure Nash equilibria. So sigma is going to be 50% here, 50% here, and zero on each of those two. So one thing that's, so two things that are very clear. First of all, this isn't a pure Nash equilibrium because coins are being flipped. Can't be a pure Nash equilibrium. Secondly, it can't correspond to a mixed Nash equilibrium either. 
because this is not a product distribution, right? So sometimes the row player plays go, and sometimes it plays stop, similarly for the column player, but none of the time is it the case that they both stop, okay? So it's not a product distribution, can't be a mixed Nash equilibrium. I claim, however, that it is a correlated equilibrium, okay? So the two players are symmetric, so let's just reason about one of them. Let's say we're the row player, okay? So let's suppose that we're recommended to stop, okay? That is, suppose when we drive up to the traffic light, we see red, right? Well, we know sigma, we know this distribution, we know these are the only two outcomes that are ever selected. We know we were told to stop, we know we see a red, so we know the other player is told to go, the other player sees a green, okay? Assuming that that player takes their recommendation and goes, we definitely better stop, okay? Our expected cost is definitely less uh, by stopping, okay? Similarly, if, uh, did I start mixing up the two cases? I forget. So if we're, I just did red, if we're shown red. So if we're shown green, then we know with certainty that the other player is shown red. And if you think about it, we do this as drivers. We assume then that they are in fact stopping, that they're doing what they're told. And uh, given that, of course our, pay, our cost is less. Oh, this is payoffs. Our payoff is higher uh, if we go. We get payoff one instead of payoff zero from stop. Okay? So we know sigma, we know the realization, and then given the update that we do, given, given the realization, indeed we should just follow the recommendation. So that's, uh, that's a little bit about correlated equilibria. Questions about correlated equilibria? So a few more things I want to say about it, but this is a good time to see if there's questions about the definition. Yeah? How does it work if there are no pure Nash equilibria? What do you mean? Like, in, is there is a correlated equilibrium for rock, paper, scissors? Like okay, so first, first thing is, so it's a good question. So. Um, it is the case that correlated equilibria are only more general than mixed Nash equilibria. So again, we should always go back and say, okay, do these things, I mean, you know, fine, you showed me this two by two game, what about in general, do these things exist? Well, in fact, the mixed Nash equilibria of a game correspond precisely to the correlated equilibria of a game where this distribution sigma happens to be a product distribution. Okay? That's certainly you know, a necessary condition. Mixed Nash equilibria by definition are product dis distributions. And for product distributions, the mixed Nash equilibrium condition coincides with the correlated equilibrium condition. Okay? So I'll again be on the next exercise set. Correspond to CE that are product distributions. And so what that means, if we return to our chart, is that this correlated equilibrium of a game subsume the mixed Nash equilibrium, and as we just observed, they can be strictly larger. Okay? So that means we don't have to worry about existence. Mixed Nash equilibria are already guaranteed to exist, so certainly correlated equilibria are guaranteed to exist. But don't forget about our motivation <coughs> for going beyond mixed Nash equilibria in the first place. Mixed Nash equilibria are hard to compute. So correlated equilibria, by virtue of being an only bigger set, you know, tautologically it can be only easier to find one, but maybe it's still hard. So let me address that question. fact, and we'll prove this in a couple of weeks, is that correlated equilibria actually are computationally tractable. That is, they can be found efficiently. So 
So that's a good thing. In fact, for those of you that know linear programming, this isn't a hard fact to establish. It's fairly straightforward to reduce the problem of computing a correlated equilibrium of a game to solving a particular linear program. So what's much more interesting and what we'll focus on in the coming lectures is that you don't need the heavy machinery of linear programming to compute a correlated equilibrium. Actually, if you just endow all of the players of a game with reasonably simple learning algorithms and let them try to learn what to play over time, suitably chosen learning algorithms will guide joint play to the set of correlated equilibria. Okay? So it's tractable not just you know, for some big laptop with CPLEX on it solving linear programs, but also for uncoordinated players playing in a game. So that's what's more interesting and that's what we'll, we'll uh, prove a little bit later. Okay? okay, so this is already, we're now already pretty happy with respect to the original goal of looking at bigger equilibrium concepts to have meaningful price of anarchy analyses. So bounding the price of anarchy of correlated equilibria, we now know is sort of always an interesting thing. They're guaranteed to exist, and they're plausible behaviorally, uh, at least with respect to the litmus test of computational tractability. But we're going to be even a little, a little greedy. We're actually going to even, just because we can, consider a still more permissive concept. It has the same type as correlated equilibrium. It's just a joint distribution directly on the outcomes of a game. And it's a coarse correlated equilibrium, or CCE. If, and this is actually simpler to understand than the correlated equilibrium, uh, if for all players I, now we're back to the usual for all deviations S prime I. Uh, and basically it's the correlated equilibrium condition but with the conditioning dropped. Okay? So there's just no SI. So you just look at the unconditional expected cost versus the unconditional expected cost under a deviation. So this is exactly what we wrote down for mixed Nash equilibrium, except now sigma need not be a product distribution. That is the only difference between this definition and uh, the mixed Nash equilibrium dis definition earlier. So again, here, all components in general of this outcome are random. We're choosing this outcome from some joint distribution over outcomes. Over here, S minus I is random and distributed the same as before. S prime I is some fixed deterministic deviation by player I. Okay? So in terms of the original semantics, one way to interpret this equilibrium condition is that now a player has to ponder deviations under less information. For correlated equilibria, I told the trusted third party, well, you knew sigma up front, because that was one piece of information you had, and the trusted third party told you the ith component of the actual realization of sigma. So this is like if you know sigma and nothing else. Okay, you are not told the ith realization, and you're pondering whether to then, you know, commit right now to doing whatever you're told, you know, once you're told later what action to follow by the trusted third party, versus deciding right now to always play some fixed action S prime I. Okay, so that's the semantics for the coarse correlated equilibrium. Another way to think about it is that to be a correlated equilibrium, you have to in some sense protect against all possible conditional deviations. So a deviation by a player who knows its realization, whereas here, you only have to protect against unconditional deviations. Okay? Deviations which are independent of the ith realization. So that's all meant to suggest, and I'll ask you to prove it formally on the exercise set, 
that indeed coarse correlated equilibria are more permissive than correlated equilibria. Okay. It's only easier for a distribution to be a CCE than it is to be a CE. Okay. And as I'll ask you to verify, uh, the inclusion is in general strict. So we're already pretty happy with correlated equilibria, but as we'll see, the learning algorithms required to guide joint play into the CCE set are somehow even simpler and even more lightweight than those needed for the correlated equilibria. So let's say even easier to compute. Okay, so it's therefore even more plausible that behavior in an actual game would be in this super big set compared to this reasonably big set. Okay? So it's only better to have guarantees for the bigger set. All right, so questions about that? Yep. Well, I mean, there's no free lunch. I mean, if M, M and E is hard to compute, it's hard to compute. So if it's a situation where the M, M and E is hard to compute, and there's the only correlated equilibria, I mean, you get a contradiction, right? So M and E is hard to compute in general. C is not hard to compute in general. So that's another sort of proof, if you want, that they can't be the same set. There will, of course, be special cases where they coincide. Just like with any hard problem, there will be special instances which are easy to solve. So that's going to be equally true for M and E as any other, say, NP hard problem. I mean, not in any sense, like if you look at a traveling salesman problem instance, is it clear if it's an easy one or not? I mean, you can try to solve it, see if it works, but uh, yeah, now, generally it, you can't certify um, hardness. So I mean, a heuristic for computing mixed strategy Nash equilibria would obviously be to compute a correlated equilibrium and cross your fingers, right? But, um, it might not work in the instances that you care about. So. All right, so as far as where, so sort of to tie all this together and explain you know, what, where we're going next. So note, on Wednesday, we saw for the first time multiple equilibria that have different objective function values. And for the price of anarchy, by definition, we focus on the worst equilibrium. The reason we do that is because we don't want to be, you know, if we can get away with it, we don't want to make predictions about which equilibrium will actually be realized. Okay, that would require further justification. We'll talk about that some next week. But if we can get away with worst case bounds that apply to all equilibria, that's the best case scenario. Now, when you take worst case over equilibria, and you start changing the equilibrium set, as we have in this picture, so as you make this equilibrium more and more permissive, what's going to happen to the price of anarchy in any fixed game? It's only going to get worse, right? There's only more equilibria, and you're taking the worst case over everything. Okay, so the price of anarchy only grows with the equilibrium set for a fixed game. Okay. So, so far we've just been talking about the price of anarchy of pure Nash equilibria. That's what, for example, our 2.5 proof applied to. And then if you look at, you know, mixed equilibria, it's only going to get bigger. And so on. So the good news is, as you go to the right, is that, you know, the plausibility of, the, of what you're bounding is increasing. Okay? So the kind of meaning of your bound gets stronger and stronger. But the quantitative you know, approximation factor might get worse and worse. Right? So what we're going to talk about on Wednesday is a general theory for proving bounds of this type. Okay? So the strongest possible upper bounds on the price of anarchy are at the far right. Okay? The strongest possible lower bounds 
would be at the far left. The lower bound here implies the same lower bound here. An upper bound here implies the same upper bound here. So we're going to seek out the strongest possible upper bounds on Wednesday. We'll also see that in a lot of the models we've been talking about, like atomic selfish routing, there's a remarkable collapse of this hierarchy. And so in fact, even though we've already seen a lower bound on the pure price of energy of 2.5 in selfish routing games, we'll prove a matching upper bound of 2.5 even for the coarse correlated equilibria of arbitrary games. So that's on Wednesday. See you then.